Good afternoon. Welcome to worship at Atherton Place. We're grateful to God that he has given us this opportunity in this place where we live and given us a desire to worship him in hopefully in spirit and in truth. A part of our worship is reading and studying and seeking to understand and apply his word because we know that his word is his word. It's his word to us in our situation and in our daily lives. The uh, scripture today for this message is in two parts, part from the Gospel of John, but I want us to read first out of the 21st chapter of the revelation of St. John, John, Revelation 21, beginning in the first verse. The anointed apostle writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And then from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning in verse 1. The words of our Lord, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now let's pray once more. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you'd give me grace to rightly interpret and apply your word for your pleasure and for our good, good living. In Jesus' name, amen. We Christians are a people of hope, and it is in the face of death when our hope shines at its brightest. In the face of death, our hope is focused on the hope of heaven. That's why Christians face death not hopelessly, but hopefully. Even in our sorrow, we grieve not hopelessly, but hopefully, in his letter to the Christians at Thessalonica, Paul wrote of the way we Christians respond to death, saying, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. We Christians do grieve when our loved ones die. But we grieve differently from non-Christians. Our grief is not less than that of non-believers, 
but it is definitely different. Unbelievers grieve for those who have died. We Christians grieve only for ourselves who are left behind. Unbelievers grieve hopelessly. Christians grieve hopefully. Our hope is anchored in our assurance of heaven that our loved ones in the Lord are in heaven. But that raises the question, what will heaven be like? Well, no one can completely answer that question, and even the scriptures do not give us all the information we desire. But the Bible does tell us, while the Bible does not tell us all we want to know about heaven, the good news is that the Bible does tell us all we need to know about heaven. The Bible tells us that heaven is real. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus says that heaven is a place, and it is a real place. And if that were not so, he would have told us. Now, there are a lot of imaginary places. Shangri-La, Camelot, Never Never Land, Fantasy Island, and the Land of Oz. But heaven is a real place. All my life, I had heard of Israel, the promised land. I'd read about it in the Bible. I'd heard about it in sermons and Sunday school lessons and lectures. I'd seen pictures and slides and paintings and photographs of it from tourists who had gone and come back. But it became experientially real for me only when I went to Israel. Heaven was experientially real to Jesus because he had been there. To those who have had to death and back experiences, heaven is experientially real because for at least for a few moments, they have been there. And heaven will become experientially real to you and me only when we've gone there. Until then, we can still affirm the reality of the place based on the testimony of Jesus and the witness of Scripture. Heaven is real. How can we be sure of that? We can be sure because we trust the word of our Lord. And we can be sure because of the nature and character of God as revealed by Jesus. We know heaven is real because God is both a loving and able God. He is able to do what his love motivates him to do. Can I repeat that? God is able to do what his love motivates him to do. James Stewart reminds us, if the great father has loved his children enough to go to the far country of sin for them, to climb the terrible slopes of Calvary for them, to send the urgency and passion of the Holy Spirit to revive and rescue them. If God so loved the world, do you imagine that at the end he will consent to have his love balked and thwarted and robbed by death? Of course not. God is able to do what his love motivates him to do. God is able to bring his twice-born children home to be with him forever in heaven. Heaven is real. Secondly, the Bible tells us that heaven is resplendent. In the Apostle John's clips of heaven from the Isle of Patmos, he wrote, And I saw a new heaven, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. Every bride I have ever seen, and I've done over 700 weddings, was radiant and beautiful. Even some rather plain women 
on their wedding day, they became beautiful women. There's something very special. I don't know what it is, but there's something very special about brides on their wedding day. They are adorned with a radiant beauty that is far more than physical. They are resplendent with the beauty of God. Heaven's like that. Heaven is resplendent with the beauty of God. As Paul puts it, things no eyes have ever seen, no ears have ever heard. Things which have not entered the heart of man are the very things God has prepared for those who love him. Think about it. Things more beautiful than any eyes have ever seen. Things more melodious than any ears have ever heard. Things more wonderful than any heart has ever even imagined are the very things that God has prepared for us in heaven. I've seen the beauty of the Rocky Mountains. I've seen the beauty of Hawaiian sunsets. I've seen the beauty of the Sea of Galilee. But I'm sure that none of that, beautiful as it was, compares to the beauty of heaven. Heaven is resplendent. Third, the Bible tells us that heaven is restoration. As John wrote of his vision of heaven, he wrote that he heard a loud voice from the throne say, Oh, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Think of all the things in this world and in this life that cause crying and mourning and pain. There's illness, injustice, prejudice, disappointment, poverty, broken promises, broken relationships, crushed dreams, poverty, hunger, crime, evil, war, accidents, and premature death. Good news, good news, good news. All of that will be no more in heaven. In heaven there will be no tears, no crying, no mourning, and no pain. All the wrongs of this world will be righted in heaven. All the injustices of this world will be rectified in heaven. All the disappointments in this world will reach fulfillment in heaven. All the illnesses and diseases of this world will be healed in heaven. Many beautiful hymns have been written by Fanny Crosby. Did you know that Fanny Crosby is blind? She was blind from birth. She has never seen the beauty of a sunset or the loveliness of a rose. But she probably wrote her finest hymn, when she dreamed about heaven, face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky, face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Sin and evil speaks loud and long within our world, but God speaks last. God always has the final word. Heaven will bring to perfect completion all that is lacking in this life and in this world. Heaven is restoration. Fourth, the Bible tells us that heaven is reunion. Jesus tells us that he himself is preparing a place for us. That where I am, there you may be also. The Apostle Paul writes about us being caught up together with those who have gone ahead of us into heaven. It was a wise man who observed, this world is a world of the dying. Heaven is a world of the living. In the world of the living, we will have everlasting fellowship. We shall be reunited with Jesus who promised that where I am, 
there you may be also. We will be reunited with all the saints of the Bible. And we shall be reunited with saved loved ones who have gone on ahead of us to heaven. Probably the most common question people ask me about heaven is, will we recognize our loved ones there? (laughs) Of course we will. Listen to me. God did not put us in special relationships here on earth only to have those special relationships broken in eternity. And though we will have a new body, an immortal body, an imperishable body in heaven, it will be a recognizable body. Do you remember when Moses and Elijah came down from heaven to visit with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? They were recognizable as Moses and Elijah. Heaven will be a place of recognition and rejoicing and reunion. At his retirement, Bishop Arthur Moore said, God has set the eternal in our hearts. Our Christian faith is never so confident, never so triumphant as when it proclaims the reality of everlasting life. We Christians march not toward the setting sun, but toward the light of morning. This life and the next are but one. Death for the Christian is simply going home, home to be with those we love. Heaven is reunion. The Bible tells us that heaven is right. John says, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. It's true that we don't know a lot about heaven, but we do know this. Heaven will be right. There will be absolutely no improvement necessary in heaven. That's because there is nothing that can possibly be better then than it is now in heaven all our unanswered questions will be answered in heaven will there be children in heaven will there be animals and pets in heaven will there be golf courses and fishing lakes in heaven will there be work to do in heaven do we go there immediately when we die let me tell you I don't know the answers to any of those questions I have my own opinion, but I don't know. Let me tell you what I do know. Heaven will be right. Here are four words you will never hear in heaven. But I was hoping. Don't worry about a thing. If heaven is not like what we think it will be, then it will be even better. Everything will be perfect. Heaven is right. Finally, the Bible teaches us that heaven is ready. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Tell me about death, the little girl asked her daddy. Death, the daddy began, is a part of God's plan for us. It's like the way when after you've played hard all day and night comes, You often fall asleep in the big chair. I pick you up in my arms. I don't wake you up. I pick you up in my arms and put you in your bed. The next morning when you wake up, you're not in that big chair. You're in your bed in the room we prepared for you. Death is like that. Heaven is a prepared place, a place prepared. For prepared people. The question is, are we prepared for it? Heaven's ready for us. Are we ready for heaven? You know, without the capacity to enjoy it, heaven might be hell. Two men went to a concert of very fine music. One had studied music for years 
had developed an enormous appreciation for fine music and a marvelous capacity to enjoy it. As the works of the maestros were played, he found tremendous delight and pleasure in it. The other man, who knew nothing about fine music and had developed no capacity at all for enjoying it, he sat there bored and uninspired. Heaven can be appreciated and enjoyed only by those who are prepared for it. How do we prepare? John tells us in Revelation 7, 13, those who are clothed in white robes, who are they? And the elder answered, those in white robes are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The only ones who are ready for heaven are those who have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are they? They are those who have trusted in Jesus Christ and Him alone for their salvation and their way to heaven. Only through Jesus, only through His completed work of redemption on the cross can we have any hope our assurance of heaven. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. It is only through faith in Jesus, trusting in him as our personal Savior and Lord, that we can properly prepare for heaven. Are you prepared? Have you put your complete trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? That is the only way to wash your robe stained by sin and evil and make it white in the blood of the Lamb. Have you done this? Heaven is ready if we are. What will heaven be like? It is real. It is resplendent. It is restoration, it is reunion, it is right, and it is ready. Good news, good news, good news. I'm ready, and I hope you are. You see, I don't want to go to heaven without you. Now pray with me, please. Father, thank you for what you have revealed of yourself and your way and your plan for our lives. This world is just a preparation place, preparing us for our eternal habitation with you in heaven. I pray for everyone who has heard this message. I pray that this message has given them hope, and if they do not have in their hearts an assurance that they are going to heaven, I pray that they would come to that place of assurance, not just wishing they'd go there, not just hoping they'd go there, but knowing for certainty that they are going there because they have put their trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. And Father, if there's anyone listening who has never done that, I thank you that they can do that right now, that they can thank you for this good news and that they can prepare for it by inviting the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for them and paid the penalty for their sins to give them their forgiveness and everlasting life as they trust in him. I pray this in his name. Amen. Well, I hope this message has been helpful to you. Uh, I tell you, (laughs) This was a lot of fun to preach. (laughs) It's always a joy to preach, but some messages are more fun than others. And uh, this is one of them. I hope it was a blessing to me to preach it, to study the scriptures as the Lord gave it to me. And I pray that uh, it's been helpful to you and encouraging to you. And if if any of you 
have heard this and still have unanswered questions, you know where I am. I'm in the uh, Atherton directory. Give me a call. I'm not too busy. And uh, I'll be glad to listen to you and as best I can from God's Word direct you so that you can not only go to heaven, but that you can have an assurance right now that you're going to heaven and not live in fear and uncertainty. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.